Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my, my very great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Sir Mark Worthington. I don't think he actually needs any introduction. Um, my dealings with Mark go back to the days when he was in the Battersea Conservative Association and I uh, was involved with uh, Wandsworth Council. And uh, he went on to great things. He uh, left uh, Battersea to go and work in the House of Commons and then um, in 1992, he went to work for Margaret Thatcher as her private secretary. And he was absolutely fantastic over 21 years in looking after Margaret. And uh, he was, I think, the, the major contributor uh, to ensuring uh, that Margaret was able to make the contribution that she did after she had ceased to be uh, Prime Minister, and to ensure that uh, the words that she uttered um, as she reached the end of her life were words which were correctly interpreted uh, to be in accordance with uh, what she actually thought, uh, because there were a lot of people out there who were trying to uh, make mischief, and Mark prevented them being able to achieve uh, their objectives. And uh, the fact that Margaret's uh, legacy is uh, so much revered is, I think, largely due uh, to the work that Sir Mark put in on her behalf during what were not easy times. So it was fantastic news when, in the New Year's Honours, um, Mark became Sir Mark. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, many yeah, of us yeah. th think that that was uh, something that should have been done a, a lot earlier, and indeed that that is not uh, the the height to which he deserves to rise. And many yeah. in, in previous generations, he would have been an earl already. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think that the work that he did uh, was, uh, in, and it indeed is, a uh, worthy of an earldom. He's been the person who has kept his council very much to himself. Um, except amongst, uh, the, for example, the Conservative Way Forward executive which I, he, he, on which he served when I was uh, the chairman. But he's now gradually coming out of his shell, rather like our sponsor this evening, Jonathan, who I congratulate on your maiden speech. Brilliant. Uh, uh, and we look forward to hearing other speeches from, from, from Jonathan on yeah, similar themes. Yeah, yeah. But Mark has, I think, made one previous speech to a much smaller gathering uh, since he uh, attained the, his, his knighthood and uh, left uh, the, the service of, of Margaret Thatcher. And we look very much forward to what he's got to set, tell us tonight because uh, he has, uh, by his words and his actions in the past, been a strong supporter of the uh, principles of freedom. And we look forward to hearing what you've got to tell us tonight. Mark. Can everyone hear me to start with? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Down at the bank. I was down at the bank last night and uh, some people couldn't hear. I certainly couldn't hear so well. But you can hear at the bank. Good. Chris, well, thank you for those very kind words. Chris is one of the great heroes of our time. Um, not only has he been a splendid MP, uh, currently for Christchurch, but in other guises too. But more importantly, Chris led the revolution in Wandsworth at the end of the 70s that transformed conservative local government. And it was the Wandsworth example, with Chris at the forefront and his colleagues, that is the absolute ideal for conservative local government today. So we owe Chris a great debt. He, yeah. You are a hero of our time, sir. Yeah. Now, President Roosevelt, uh, not our favourite one, FDR, um, <laughs> said about there was three S's that you should follow when making a speech. Be sincere, be, spe be seedy, speedy, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to that later. Uh, and be seated. Now, Simon, I think, is expecting something a little longer, but I, so I have to sing for my supper this evening. Now, having listened to some of the, uh, the speakers and sessions over the last two days, with the impressive 
discussions that have followed up. I feel a little bit of trepidation speaking to you tonight. It rather reminds me of the story of the primary school class that had been set a project on ancient Greece. At the end of the project, the teacher asked each of the pupils to stand up and say a few words about a given subject. And she came to one little girl and she said, now Alice, will you stand up and tell us about Socrates? So Alice stood up and said, well, miss, Socrates was a very wise Greek. He went around giving the people of Athens lots of advice. They murdered him. And on that basis, I think I should try to avoid offering advice this evening. Um, I have to say, Simon, many congratulations to you and your team, as Jonathan already said, and many congratulations to all your partner organisations that have made this weekend so successful. And I hope you're all enjoying it. Yeah. So, thank you. But more importantly, I'd like to say a big thank you to you for coming. Because although a lot of credit goes to the organisations, this weekend wouldn't be a success without you. So thank you very much all for being here. Now, when Simon first told me he was playing a freedom weekend, I did somewhat wonder why anyone would wish to spend a glorious spring weekend shut up in a Bournemouth hotel talking about freedom. Uh, obviously the list of distinguished participants and the exciting programme rather answered some of my scepticism. But on detailed examination of the weekend's programme, everything was revealed. For there, in the small print, it announced that on both nights, the conference bar will remain open until 5 a.m. <laughs> uh, for those who are a little bit more abstemious than that, uh, I would remind you of the advice not to worry about avoiding temptation. As you grow older, it will avoid you. <laughs> uh, Simon has asked me to talk about Mrs. Thatcher and freedom. And it brought back to me the words of a late 19th century hymn that she used to recite. I shall say it rather than sing it. <laughs> These things shall be, a loftier race than e'er the world hath known shall rise, with flame of freedom in their souls, and light of knowledge in their eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, with flame of freedom in their souls and light of knowledge in their eyes. That seems to me to sum up what we are all about here this weekend. For freedom allows us to expand our knowledge, and knowledge allows us to expand our freedom. They go hand in hand. Now, Mrs. Thatcher often talked about freedom. Only rarely did she talk about liberty, except when in the United States. For her, liberty was rather too Frenchified a term. <laughs> and she thought it had far too many revolutionary connotations. Uh, there's a story that in her very early days as Prime Minister, on one of her visits, her first visit was to Valérie Giscard d'Estaing. At this point, he'd already served as finance minister for nine years and president for five, and saw himself as a distinguished and experienced statesman. In contrast, Mrs. Thatcher was a relative novice in international affairs, and her pre-summit briefing warned her that the president could be a little bit superior. So it was no surprise when the president launched into a long discourse on liberty being France's gift to the world. <laughs> Uncharacteristically, Mrs. Thatcher stayed silent, and the meeting ended in a rather cool manner. Afterwards, the British ambassador commented uh, and commended her on her restraint, saying, I'm glad we warned you, Prime Minister, that the President can be somewhat haughty. He rather believes himself to a grand aristocrat and looks down his nose on lesser mortals. Well, that doesn't bother me, said Mrs. Thatcher. I worked out at once that his nose was the only remotely aristocratic thing about him. <laughs> um, the ambassador, needless to say, was most relieved that she hadn't said that 
at the time. Uh, people say that she didn't have a sense of humour. Actually, she had a, a very wry sense of humour. And on, on, on lots of occasions, it was aimed at the Foreign Office and Foreign Affairs Matters. Uh, she, she found out, there was one joke she found particularly funny uh, about a man who is rushing to a meeting at the Foreign Office. He has never been there before. He lives outside London. And he's rushing down Whitehall, late, rather hot and flustered and bothered. He doesn't know where he's going, but he sees a young policeman. And he's, he stops and says, Thank goodness I found you, Constable. Uh, delighted. But can you tell me which side the Foreign Office is on? And the, and the, the Constable turns around and says, Yes, sir, not ours. <laughs> For Mrs. Thatcher, it had to be freedom. A good old English word. Now, of course she wouldn't have claimed that the English invented freedom. Well, perhaps only on occasion. Uh, she knew that freedoms existed in ancient times. In the Athens of Aristotle, Pericles and Demosthenes, and in the Rome of Cicero. But perhaps it was Britain's or particularly England's destiny, to shape the ideas of freedom which we recognise most. From the Anglo-Saxon Witan and Moot, the Royal Charter of Henry I, King John's famous Magna Carta, the Parliament of Simon de Montfort, through the Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. Over a thousand years in these isles, the principles of freedom were taking shape and being developed into customs, practices, and institutions. Today many see Magna Carta as the first great marker in the advance of freedom. Mr. Thatcher's favourite writer, Rudyard Kipling, certainly underscored the significance in his poem The Reeds of Runnymede, which she always liked to quote. At Runnymede, at Runnymede, oh hear the reeds at Runnymede, you mustn't sell, delay, deny, a freeman's right to liberty. It wakes the stubborn Englishry. We saw it roused at Runnymede. And still when mob and monarch lays to ruder hand on English ways, the whisper wakes, the shudder plays across the reeds at Runnymede. And Thames that knows the mood of kings and crowds and priests and such like things rolls deep and dreadful as he brings their warning down from Runnymede. For Mrs. Thatcher, the development of freedom was intimately linked to the character of the people, or the stubborn Englishry, as Kipling put it. And Mrs. Thatcher, of course, herself was quite capable of being extremely stubborn. The, uh, I, I think everyone will know the story of the, the 1984 uh, negotiations with our European uh, cousins uh, to, 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 on the rebate, and the, where she suddenly slammed the table and declared, I want my money back. <laughs> um, the freedoms of England were not the result of any great romantic vision or single ideological blueprint. There were no catastrophic breaks of the past. Kings came and went, sometimes violently, but the common law continued. Even our glorious revolution was very unrevolutionary by the standards of others. Freedom evolved, thus it endured. The advance of freedom here was gradual. It drew on those stubborn, cussed, dogged, awkward qualities which were typically English. It was rooted in everyday practical matters, not soaring concepts. And it's perhaps interesting to note that in the great age of revolution, in the second half of the 18th century, Britain's national personification, the figure we chose to encapsulate all we stood for, was not some heroic warrior or mythic champion but good old John Bull, a stout, middle-aged, country-dwelling, jolly, matter-of-fact yeoman. 
It was this solid, steady reliability which Edmund Burke and his contemporaries most admired about the British Constitution as the rest of Europe descended into chaos. And perhaps Tennyson best sums it up. A land of settled government, a land of just and old renown, where freedom slowly broadens down from precedent to precedent. Now, Mrs. Thatcher's belief in freedom was rooted in her faith. Indeed, for her, an understanding of freedom could not be separated from an understanding of the Judeo-Christian traditions and teachings. Mrs. Thatcher held that in God's eyes we were all created equal, that God blessed each and every one of us with unique talents and abilities, and that by using them, we benefit ourselves, our families, and our communities. Her declaration that there is no such thing as society was not a denial of the essential elements of civil society, individuals, families, communities. It was a rejection of the collective, where the state both replaces and denies the initiatives and responsibilities of the people. As Keith Joseph once said, responsible individualism should be our battle cry. Edmund Burke's little platoons, the inspiration for an active community. And if Mrs. Thatcher needed any reminding of the dangers of collective irresponsibility, she had framed on the wall of her office the famous quote from Edmund Bur Edward Bur Gibbon's Ancient Athens. In the end, more than freedom, they wanted security. They wanted a comfortable life, and they lost it all. Security, comfort, and freedom. When the Athenians finally wanted not to give to society, but for society to give to them. When the freedom they wished for most was freedom from, from responsibility, then Athens ceased to be free and was never free again. Yeah. Now, Mrs. Thatcher did believe that the state needed to be strong, but it also needed to be limited. She believed that the state should be the servant, not the master, the custodian, not the collaborator, the umpire, not the player. She believed that states, societies, economies, which allow the individuals to flourish, themselves also flourish. Those which dwarf, crush, distort, manipulate, and ignore them cannot progress. And that those eras in which a high value has been placed on the individual are the ones where mankind has made the greatest advances. She would often point out that though natural resources were important, it was the efforts and enterprise, the policies and practices of the people which made a country rich. For man's greatest resource is man himself. Now, over this we get much, a lot has been said about money, particularly the fact that money doesn't belong to the government, it belongs to us, the taxpayer. And this is actually very conscious of this. There's a story about uh, a, a moment when Keith, Keith Joseph, who was then education secretary in her government, uh, Mrs. Thatcher was very worried about overspend in that department, and she had her private secretary phone up his office and say she wanted to see him immediately. He was spending far too much money could he come round at 3.15? Julie, he got ready, got his box ready, go round with his assistant, and his private secretary turned to him just as he was leaving the office, and he and said to him, uh, Sir Keith, uh, is there anything else we can get you? Keith looked at him in his own inimical way and said, yes, ambulances at 3.30. <laughs> now, William Taft, the 27th President of the United States declared that substantial progress towards better things can rarely be taken without developing new evils 
requiring new remedies. <laughs> and here we face two enormous dilemmas. The first is the impact of ever greater personal freedom on the disciplined structure of a free society. For freedom does not equate to a free for all. A free society is not an anything goes culture. In such a world, liberty descends into license. Liberty must be limited if it is to be possessed, Burke's words. In a free society, we should right, be rightly wary of prescription. But to enjoy our personal freedoms, there has to be a framework for as James Madison, one of America's founding fathers and president of the United States, and that's the man most responsible for the drawing up of the Constitution, understood. Liberty may be endangered by the abuses of liberty as well as by the abuses of power. But I welcome the fact that we on the centre-right of politics are debating the issues of personal freedom. Some of this is going to be uncomfortable. I, tomorrow I think you're debating immigration and both the benefits and the negatives of it. Uh, drugs policy is another issue and I believe we are right to be looking at the scope, the limits and the boundaries of freedom. These are issues, ladies and gentlemen, which cannot be hijacked as the issues of human rights and civil liberties were in the decades after the Second World War by those who have least respect for them. The second dilemma is the extent to which the pursuit of liberty in the name of what is good can undermine it. One example that has been discussed today is to look at controversies over surveillance and intelligence gathering where the spectre of Orwell's 1984 looms large. And with ideal timing, you will have seen that only a few days ago, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the originator of the World Wide Web, called for a new Magna Carta to protect the rights of ordinary people using the web against the encroaching power of the state. Perhaps someone you should invite him to be a keynote speaker next year. Now, there has always been a conflict, inherent conflict, between freedom and security. Each generation has to reassert the balance. There's no easy answer, but a radical rethink is required as to how such security operations are sanctioned and controlled. We need much more rigorous justification for action and, must, and much more trusted oversight. And then, of course, there are what I might term the do-good police. All those health and safety experts. You know the ones? They tell us not to jump, not to climb, not to run. They tell us not to smoke, not that I do. Uh, not to drink too much, well, we'll skip over that bit. Uh, not to eat so much sugar or so much salt, nor to be so obese. In today's Britain, ladies and gentlemen, there is a danger that we spend more effort on policing our waistline than our coastline. <laughs> now, now, at the heart of all this, of course, is a core of good good intent, but it is corrosive and smothering. It diminishes our independence and our self sense of self-responsibility. Over time, if not challenged, it will make us a lesser people. In his own inevitable way, Vice President Dan Quayle, a good but not oft quoted Man. Well said, I believe that we are on an irreversible trend towards freedom and democracy, but that could change. I think probably Ronald Reagan got it right when he reminded us that 
freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. Mrs. Thatcher was very conscious of that sentiment. For her generation, freedom was hard won. A century of two world wars and a cold one. There had been enormous sacrifice. As she later wrote in her journal during the Falklands War, in the fight for liberty, we lose our bravest and best. Now we know the sacrifices that previous generations made for us. She was often fond of saying, that which thy fathers bequeathed thee, earn it anew if thou wouldst possess it. That is the task for today's generation. That is the spur for us all. Occasions such as this provide us with an opportunity to explore those challenges and to reinvigorate our principles and revivify our faith. And so, ladies and gentlemen, my hope is that tomorrow, when we leave here, each of us takes away a little more of that flame of freedom in our souls and light of knowledge in our eyes. Thank you very much.